I like TV. I'm sure you guys do too, but also based on what you like out of my videos, you seem to like the dark, the twisted, how dare you, sick f So I thought it'd be a good thing to kind of fuse those together and talk about dark TV episodes. But in this video, we're not going to just talk about dark TV episodes because I could just fill this entire thing up with horror shows. Instead, what we're going to do is talk about shows that usually are kind of lighthearted and fun, but for some reason or another have had an episode that is extremely controversial, dark, gritty, and focus on messed up subjects. So as we go down this iceberg today, we're not going to rank things based on obscurity. No, instead, we're going to rank things based on theme. At the start, it'll be themes that are dark, but not too too bad and as we go down things are going to get kind of messed up especially when you consider that these shows are kind of trying to make content for young people kids families and they're going to be dealing with some messed up things so this one's really good i so want to get into it without further ado this is the unusually dark tv episodes Iceberg Explained. Kicking us off in this first tier, we're going to be focusing on things that are perhaps disturbing imagery. Just things that are overall gross and or scary. So our very first entry today is the Spongebob episode 13B, and I was a teenage Gary. It happened in the first season of Spongebob, and if I remember correctly, what happened was that Spongebob wanted to go to, I think it was like a jellyfish convention, and he convinces Squidward to look after Gary. I think this is the first big episode about Gary. And Squid was like, okay, whatever, Spongebob, as long as you f***ing get out of here. So Patrick and Spongebob go off to the convention. Squidward says he's going to look after them, but he actually just wants a couple days of peace. And by the end of the weekend, Gary is starving to death. He is on death's door about to die. And Squidward tries to find out a way to make Gary eat because he hasn't been fed or hydrated in, you know, three days. And Spongebob, he calls up the ambulance. And it's like, oh crap, you know, my snail's about to die. Doctor comes in with a big syringe and he's like, all right, have at it. <laughs> but unfortunately, Spongebob accidentally gets hit with the syringe. And this causes Spongebob to, I guess, turn into a snail. And the transformation scene, let me say, is kind of messed up. The idea that you're turned into something else is kind of scary i guess especially for a kid's show the idea of zombification that you are not in control of your mind your body anymore is maybe something that's not too scary for older audiences but especially because spongebob is a family show there might have been some kids who kind of saw this and were like oh crap eventually squidward also gets hit with the syringe and he also turns into a snail ever so slightly twisted there's definitely darker stuff as we go down but nonetheless, it's definitely not what the show would become. It's not too lighthearted and fun. Even though there are a few jokes, it definitely doesn't go along with the rest of the tone of the show. And we do have a few more episodes down here. So it's not exactly too foreign for SpongeBob to do scarier episodes, but this one was definitely the first. Okay, I've got to talk about this episode, Pingu's Dream. And this one, I don't know how this was allowed to air because it honestly looks like a bad trip. Basically, Pingu goes to sleep and he has a nightmare. That is the entire episode. He just goes to sleep, his bed starts walking off, and then he gets hunted down by this massive seal. The imagery here, especially when you consider that Pingu is meant for like three-year-olds. Pingu is not meant for anyone over the age of like five. It's a show made for young, young kids. This would be a little bit kind of scary for them, I'm sure, if they're just watching from their cots. The episode has no morals, because how can it? You know, it's just a nightmare. It has no story because it's a nightmare. It's nothing, it's just a nightmare. And you're forcing four-year-olds to watch Pingu have a nightmare. It's slightly inappropriate, but there's not too much here for me to kind of carry on about this for five minutes. So let's move on to the next entry. The Treehouse of Horror episodes are some of the most creative and sometimes best little segments that The Simpsons had to offer. Even in the modern day where The Simpsons obviously isn't what it used to be back 20 years ago, it is kind of interesting to see what they have to pull out the bag for Treehouse of Horror because some of the best moments of the show have come from those episodes. Did you know though that back in the first Treehouse of Horror, Marge had to address the audience saying that tonight's show is a little bit kind of messed up, it's a little bit dark, and I believe this is something she actually had to do because maybe back in the 90s, scary things on TV were a little bit more taboo. Today, I don't think it would matter, but maybe back then it had to be said because Treehouse of Horror wasn't a thing yet. We didn't know where it would go or how dark it could get. And it never was that bad, just a bit spooky here and there. There were some episodes 
with characters that you like dying, getting decapitated, getting their limbs chopped off. Throughout the episodes, there have been some dark moments, obviously, because it is kind of Halloween themed. So I don't really have anything else to say for that one. Let's get on to the next. I'm not big on this one. Mr. Meaty. The episode on the iceberg, I've forgotten its name, is one where a character eats raw meat and then gets a tapeworm. This is one of the ugliest shows ever conceived. Let me just get that straight. It's ugly as fuck. This aired on Nickelodeon. Why? Why? <laughs> The least I could say about it is that yes, the idea of a character getting a tapeworm is dark. Um, if you don't know what a tapeworm is, look it up, but you should. I think they find that it's like inside his stomach or something and every time he tries to eat something it comes out and grabs it and then they have to like get it out and then it's like strangling him and there is a bit of dark imagery here. And as I said before, this show is on Nickelodeon, so you've got to think that kids are going to be watching this show. I don't know who's watching this. Definitely out of all the shows I watched today, this one is probably like the worst. I hated this one. <laughs> From the worst to the best, The Last Airbender. If you have not seen this show, pause this video now, watch all three seasons of The Last Airbender and get back to it, alright? Because... It's a phenomenal show and this episode was pretty dark in all the right ways. If you don't care about it though or just want a quick reminder, Team Avatar meet up with this sweet old lady, Hama, who is one of the remaining members of the Southern Water Tribe. She gives accommodation to Aang and the rest of the crew who were deep in Fire Nation territory, forming a connection with Katara with whom she knew her grandmother, I believe. So she's a grandmother-esque character. Katara kind of sees her as this kind of nurturing old lady. However, just when the group is becoming comfortable with her, she reveals that she is not only a waterbender, but also a bloodbender, which is essentially the idea that you are able to control another person's blood. Now, in the show, she did this to escape captivity. Her character is actually kind of layered. They bring up ideas of survival at any cost. But for a show that can be enjoyed by the entire family, the imagery here is actually quite dark with it showing resistance, but the resistance being futile and the idea to be able to control someone's body without them even being able to put up a fight against it is kind of messed up. It's puppetry. You wouldn't want to be a puppet, would you? The show is otherwise very happy-go-lucky and in a series about genocide, which we will get to later, <laughs> they're able to get around it a lot. This episode was against the run of tone of the show. It doesn't usually steer into horror, but the time it does, it nails it on the head. A phenomenal episode. I won't stay on this one for long, but episode 35 of the Pokemon anime is the Dratini episode. It's titled The Legend of Dratini on the List. And this is the first one that is BANNED CONTENT! The episode I assume revolves around Dratini, I wouldn't know because I can't watch it in my native tongue. They never translated this episode to English because I believe that there is a safari owner or something who pulls a gun on Ash and asks, like, do you want to get shot, bitch? Do you want to f***ing die? TV censors found this a bit over-excessive. It didn't need to be in the show. <laughs> and although Pokemon has controversies, they tend to usually be around the merchandise and stuff like that. Never usually in the show, but back in the Indigo League, there were a few instances. <laughs> Beauty in the beach much. So yeah, I mean, Guy pulls a Glock on Ash and then Japan's like, no, no one can ever see this. So you can find it, it is online but it was never translated to English. And I guess therefore it kind of is Lost Media. It's very tough to find because it hasn't been aired for a long, long time. On to the next tier, we have Despair and Depression. Episodes where a character gets really, really sad, more than usual, into a state of numb depression. So at first we're going to talk about Simpsons Season 8, Episode 8, Hurricane Neddy. This is an episode I actually quite enjoy, maybe up until the third act, but essentially what happens here is that Ned Flanders' house gets destroyed in a hurricane and this kind of puts him on tipping point because the town try and help him, the town fail miserably, and Ned, a person who rarely does anything wrong, kind of questions his faith in God. He's followed the Bible to a T, yet he's lost almost everything. These are the episodes that Simpsons really hits home with. Any episode with Ned kind of questioning his faith I always enjoy. Anyways, by the end of the episode he checks himself into a mental hospital and we kind of get a bit of background on Ned's character. Why is he the way he is? And things are resolved quite easily but there are parts of the episode where he's kind of in these shelters completely and utterly depressed. 
And for such a positive character, this is really against the grain. Ned Flanders is usually quite good at hiding his emotions, but in this episode, his pain is much more visible. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Simpsons though does have a few episodes on this list, so we'll have to move on to get to them. First though, we'll have to get past South Park with the episode, You're Getting Old. This was the seventh episode of the 15th season and takes place after Stan hits his 10th birthday and realizes that everything is shit. The music he used to like sounds like shit. The movies he used to like look like shit. His friends just chat shit. The radio is shit. Everything in his life is shit. South Park is always such a wacky show and though their episodes do have meaning, it's usually covered up by layers of absurdity and absolute off the wall bonkers stupid stuff. But this is one episode to really hit you in the emotions. By the end of the episode, Stan's mum and dad get separated. His friends don't want to chat to him because he always bums them out. And it's just a really profound message on puberty and growing up. Sometimes you'll outgrow people. Sometimes you'll be outgrown. Things don't stay the same. They're constantly changing those teenage years. This episode and its follow-up are one of a kind, just focusing on the getting older aspect of these young boys' lives. Because the show resets after every episode, we don't get to see how they grow and develop, usually at least. And this one definitely presents how the show can hit the emotional marks as and when it wants to. Kind of similar to South Park, The Fresh Prince is usually playful. It's lighthearted, it's fun. There isn't usually too many deep things that happen in the show, but Papa's Got New Excuses completely changes that around. And if we're talking about deep, emotional or dark moments of the show, this one is definitely one to be remembered. The big plot point is that Will Smith's father turns up after 14 years to spend some time with Will, but by the end of the episode, he walks out on him yet again. In perhaps the best scene of the entire show, in my opinion, Will Smith just breaks down. He questions himself, why doesn't my dad love me? Why is he always trying to get out of my life? This was even bigger because for Will Smith, a lot of his friends grew up without any dads. He grew up with one, albeit separated from his mum, so we didn't get to see him as much. And it definitely does hit home for a lot of people. There's a reason why this might be considered the best scene of the entire show. Will Smith is in complete despair on his self-image. And it is a beautiful moment in a show that is usually, again, fun, playful. This is dramatic and deep and heartfelt. The Mr. Rogers Neighborhood episode, Conflict. This is also a piece of band content. I think a lot of the time, the best ways to convey a serious message is actually through the most simplistic form of telling it almost to children. Animal Farm, for example, is a good representation of this. It's a very complex story told through simple means. A section of the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood episode Conflict focuses on war and they do it through hand puppets. They discuss war-torn countries and how things are just awful there. They talk about even if you're the winner, you kind of are the loser because it's just not nice to take people's stuff, to take their land, to take their territory. And keep in mind that this episode was made maybe not at the height of the Cold War, but the Cold War would still be going on for another seven, eight years. It released in 1983. And despite it having an important message, this episode has not aired in 25 years because I guess the higher ups decided that whilst the message might be important, the people watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood just aren't old enough yet to fully understand the complexities of war, but for a show that is usually so, so innocent, to talk about war and talk about bombs, <laughs> they actually say like bombs and guns in the episode, it kind of is out of left field. Important message, but it's like, wait, what? what? <laughs> the last entry we have for depression and despair is the Spongebob episode, Gone. The story's a simple one. Spongebob wakes up to find out that the entire town is gone. After a day, he realizes this and he vows that he will keep everyone's memory alive. And so he tries to do this by reenacting everyone. He recreates his neighborhood shenanigans. He goes to work and recreates shenanigans over there. He goes to boat school, recreates shenanigans over there. It's just a shenanigastic time. But then he starts to go a bit crazy and he believes that boats are out to kill him and he kind of cracks a few times throughout the episode. You notice that without anyone there to talk to him, he starts to crack and he starts to get really sad and depressed. And whilst he might wear a happy face, the facade is only skin deep. SpongeBob is usually such a happy, positive, upbeat character, but in this episode, we get to see perhaps sides of him that aren't usually seen. I'm talking like 
severe despair. Sometimes we'll see him cry over him stubbing his toe or something like that, but in this episode, we get to see him at his most vulnerable almost. He is genuinely sad that everyone's left, and this isn't something that is usually seen within the show. So yeah, positive character, reduced to depression despite the fact that he is happy 99% of the time. Things are getting a little bit more real now because next up on the iceberg we have abuse. So for the first century we'll make this very simple, it is sitcom special episodes. Episodes of a sitcom that usually need the help of a celebrity guest star to understand very deep topics. Abuse comes in all kinds of forms and ranges and so this could be about anything, the entry is very vague. But if you were to have watched sitcoms back in the 80s or 90s, there were episodes, and we'll probably get onto them very soon, that were special episodes and they dealt with topics not usually dealt with by the rest of the series. As I said, it's not very specific so I can't talk too much about it, but let's go into a specific example and maybe you guys might understand a little bit better. So we have the Full House episode, Silence is Not Golden. This is the 17th episode of the 6th season of the show and is classed as a very special episode. The show, for the most part, is probably like the pinnacle of just a cheesy 80s or 90s sitcom, you know? But in this episode, things get a little bit more real because you have this one character who comes into school and he's kind of chatting a bit of shit. He gets roasted, but the teacher sees and she's like, all right, well, split off into pairs and write about the other person and why they're nice. I never watched the show, so please do bear with me, but essentially, he goes to this girl's house who I believe is part of the family in Full House. She's like the middle child. And it is revealed that he gets beaten by his dad. His mum passed away and his dad beats him very severely. So severely, in fact, that one week he can't come to school. And the way that this episode kind of handles things, I actually thought was quite mature. I, it definitely handled things better than I thought it would have because they discuss, should I tell someone? What happens if I do? What happens if I don't? Is it my business? Is it my place? What are the consequences of this? It discusses appreciation for good parents, parents that do nurture their child and teach them not by fear, but by love. At the end of the episode, we find out that the little boy has been taken away by Child Protective Services. The dad, I don't know what happened to him, but I, I'm assuming the police are knocking on his door and the boy has been fostered off. Surprisingly mature for such a kind of cheesy sitcom, but for a cheesy 80s and 90s sitcom to kind of touch on this topic is rare. It doesn't happen very often. It does happen, but it definitely goes against the usual feel of the show. You don't watch these shows to get hit in the feels, you just watch them because they're fun, mindless, happy. Everything gets wrapped up neatly at the end of 22 and a half minutes. It doesn't have to be thought provoking, it just has to be light laughs here and there. So definitely an interesting one. This is true. I once wrote a university essay on Brooklyn Nine-Nine and how it handles diversity and very special episodes. And I can't think of a better, very special episode than Moo Moo. Brooklyn Nine-Nine has always handled the big issues well until recent seasons, but Moo Moo was definitely the crown jewel of the big topics, the deep emotional moments. And essentially the story is that Terry gets racially profiled in his own neighborhood whilst looking for his children's toy. Or it might be a blanket or something, but he's looking for their Moo Moo. And yeah, he gets stopped and searched and arrested for a character like Terry. This is kind of big. This episode deals with many themes that would later come into the forefront of the show, albeit forced by real life events, but Moo Moo did it first and did it much, much better. After confronting the cop that stopped him, it's made clear that this guy is as plain racist and didn't see the errors of his ways. Terry wants to file a complaint but is warned that by ratting on his fellow officer, he might put his own career trajectory in peril. And this is more evident in the episode's bittersweet ending. Now, racial profiling is something that's not too common in sitcoms, and let's be fair, it's an all too real part of life. As I said before, this wasn't the first and it wasn't the last episode to deal with the big topics and the social political issues, but this one definitely did it the best, and it probably went to the darkest places. Most people don't watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine to be fed kind of social statements, but this episode did it so well, being able to fuse a very real message with some light-hearted laughs throughout. Phenomenal episode of television. Static Shock. I forget the title of the episode, but it'll be here, and I haven't watched this show, but this episode is 
kind of real for a show that seems to be not taking itself too seriously this one definitely did address serious issues this blonde kid Richie his dad is overtly racist to his african-american friend Virgil this causes Richie to run away and I believe the main plot of the episode is that Richie hates his dad and also everyone else hates his dad because his dad's a bit of an ass I'll be honest I don't know what this massive armadillo is doing in the episode <laughs> I get that it's like a superhero show but it was funny to see this important message surrounded by like a man-sized armadillo that's trying to mug Richie <laughs> there's not too much more to unpack here it's a message that has been said before but unfortunately it's a message that has to carry on being said it seemed more like a show that didn't really care it was like a fun kind of light-hearted woo you know superheroes yeah what's going on man that kind of stuff and i assume this isn't the type of topic the show kind of dealt with on the weekly things seemed a lot more upbeat and more kind of cheesy superhero late 90s kind of style but this is a message that they thought that they needed to say and say it they most certainly did. So it is a new day and first up on the agenda is perhaps the darkest ever Simpsons episode, Homer's Enemy. One of the best episodes in my opinion, definitely in my top 20, top 15. So there's this guy, his name is Frank Grimes and he has never been given a chance in life. Every single thing has knocked him down. He has never caught a break, ever. And one day he's featured on the news and later gets a job at the power plant working alongside Homer. We, the audience, know Homer. He's a lovely guy, but he's not very good at his job. He just works it to support his family. Frank takes notice of his incompetence and takes offense to it because for someone who has worked so hard like himself, to see this dude who is just coasting by get a cushy job with a nice salary is just insulting to him. And every single time he tries to prove to the power plant Homer's incompetence, it backfires. He is the antagonist of this episode, but he is correct. He is just a normal guy living in this cartoon world, and eventually it breaks him. Later on in the episode, he actually plans to sabotage Homer to try and expose him for the fraud he is. And after the entire plan acts like nothing's happened, this was the straw that broke the camel's back because Frank goes insane. He breaks down and starts running around the power plant acting like Homer. And in a cruelly dark twist ending, this is Black Comedy 101. He grabs some, I guess, like electrics and dies. <laughs> If Homer would have done that, he would have absolutely just got shocked up and survived. Frank dies at the workplace. Now, most Simpsons deaths are played for emotion. You know, I'm thinking like Bleeding Gums Murphy or Homer's mom. You know, most of them are played for sad little, oh, I can't believe it. Like this character is never coming back. Frank Grimes' death is actually, like, bitterly dark, but actually I chuckle every time I see it. Maybe that just makes me a sociopath. I don't know. <laughs> it's one of those things where you just can't believe they went there. The show was rebellious, yes, but it always did have a calm, soothing centre of the family comes first. It always had good morals deep down. Frank Grimes' death completely chucks that out of the window because, again, Frank Grimes is correct. In any other show, he would be the hero, he would be the protagonist, and eventually he would expose Homer for being an absolute buffoon. But in this show, he gets killed. An incredible piece of subversive writing. It's phenomenal. So the next series about death and disease, I guess Frank Grimes could also be kind of classified as this, but this is episodes where a character has died or they might die or they get some sort of disease and everything drops to a standstill so we can focus on it. So we're getting into the dark stuff now. Kicking us off in this new tier, we have Futurama Season 4, Episode 7, Jurassic Bark, specifically requested by a member of my Discord, so definitely do join the Discord link in the description. The protagonist Fry finds his dead dog on exhibit. Throughout the episode, we cut from the past to the present to see the relationship that the two had before Fry was frozen. They then try to clone the fossilized remains so that Fry would be able to get his dog back a thousand years later. However, this is ruined by Bender and eventually all hope is lost. It is a sad moment because dogs are just part of the family. Fry only had his dog that day that he got frozen. He had no other friends, really. The ending montage is so sweet and very emotional. It's definitely heartfelt. To lose the one person or one thing that you had is heartbreaking. And obviously the death of a beloved animal is just plain sad. And for a show, again, like Futurama, zany, wacky, it's not their forte, but they handle it so well and so maturely. And the ending montage is like, I think everyone loves it. It is just a 
episode that doesn't fit into the usual kind of tropes and cliches of the show, but definitely one that is well-deserved and one of the best of the entire series. I think everyone has seen at least one episode of Arthur growing up. It's been on for about 25 years now, so it only makes sense. But season 13, episode 5 dealt with a topic that might be more big and more mature than anything the show has and will ever deal with. Season 13, episode 5 was The Great McGrady and it dealt with cancer. For a show like Arthur, the show that is the essence of innocence and just playful kind of learning and morals, this is deep. To talk about cancer, to talk that, you know, someone might get sick from cancer, someone might get really sick, is something that I don't think they've done before and I don't think they've done it since. In the episode, I believe it is the school cafeteria lunch lady who gets cancer and she has a little bit of time off work. She obviously goes through chemo and the kids are trying to understand why and what this is. It's new territory for them. You've got the little white rabbit and he just cares about his lunch. He's like, oh my God, this shit is fucking trash. And then everyone else is like, oh wait, you might die. <laughs> it is awfully mature for a show that is definitely aimed towards children, but it is such an important message because it's not like cancer waits for you to grow up and then strikes. It's not like it goes, oh, you got a family. Okay, I'll get to you later. Cancer can affect absolutely anyone. I kind of feel like it is something that you have to learn because you're just ignorant to the wider world when you're that age. And The Great McGrady definitely shines a light on an issue that a lot of kids would be facing, whether it be themselves or their relatives. It's a very dark place for the show, but if there was going to be a show to deal with it, I kind of feel like Arthur is the right choice because it breaks it down into the most simplistic, easy to digest ways that kids can understand, but still not be like traumatized by. Very solid episode overall, despite the fact that it goes against everything else that the show usually does. This will be the final time I talk about The Simpsons in the season 11 episode, I believe, Alone Again, Natural Diddly. It was the 14th episode of the 11th season, and this is the one where Maud dies. The reason that the writers wanted to do this was a pay dispute with Maud's actress, Maggie Roswell. And Fox wanted to open up more options for future Ned storylines. And so with all that said, they actually decided to kill off Maud to give Ned a little bit more substance and a little bit more to do. And as I said before, all of the deaths tend to be played for emotions. Maud's definitely was, but absolutely it had to have been the most out of nowhere death of the entire show. Still to this day, people remember that episode because it just was so out of nowhere. Maud gets hit with a t-shirt cannon after Homer ducks after, what, finding a penny or something. And she falls off the stadium and dies. Ned is grief stricken. And out of all of the episodes where he questions his relationship with God, this has to be the most. This pushes him to his absolute limits because it's one thing losing a house. It's another thing losing a spouse. That didn't intend to rhyme, but... <laughs> We've had an episode like Who Shot Mr. Burns before, but it's not like they killed Mr. Burns. To have an out of nowhere death like this really did keep people on their toes. Still to this day, it hasn't really been replicated since, at least not a character of Maud's importance because she is married to one of the biggest secondary characters. If you were to have made like death predictions for The Simpsons, her name wouldn't even be in the pot. It was so out of nowhere and so different for this show to allow them to open up new storylines. Definitely an out of nowhere surprise. Speaking of out of nowhere deaths, Family Guy season 12, episode six, Life of Brian. I still remember when this one aired on TV, the outrage that fell upon the show paralleled no other <laughs> that I've ever seen online. But what happens in this episode? Brian gets hit by a car and dies. That is kind of the essence of it. The creative decision was done by Seth MacFarlane to kind of go, ooh, anything could happen. Kind of like the Maud thing where you're like, oh wait, they can actually kill off characters here. So for a second, it seemed like that. And then two episodes later, they brought him back. So not exactly. I think most people online thought that Seth MacFarlane was just done with the show and he just wanted to like write himself out of it. I don't really watch Family Guy, but having watched this episode, they did do it all right. It's a show that very, very sparsely goes into the emotional or the deep or the tragic and for a baby to lose his dog when you think about it is kind of messed up even if Stewie is like an evil genius at the end of the day he's still a baby it's a brutal death too like there's blood he gets hit around he's got like scars and stuff he's getting operated on it's pretty brutal and the show does go there only being ruined by the fact that Brian comes back two episodes later I don't think I have anything more to say on to the murder tier next this next tier is about murder so someone threatening murder or someone being murdered someone murdering someone else 
all of that in this next tier. So, who do we have up? So, Batman the Brave and the Bold is up to bat next, and... <laughs> but not intended. <laughs> this is the 11th episode of the second season of Batman the Brave and the Bold, and it focuses around Bruce Wayne's parents, their demise, and who was the culprit. We find out that this guy, his name is Joe Chill, I think, was to blame, and Batman tracks him the fuck down. Now, first of all, he gets a little flashback with his parents and he's allowed to kind of interact with them and speak to them. So that's kind of cool. Speaking to dead parents is always a light topic for a kind of family show, kids show, whatever you want to call it. And that is kind of sad that, you know, you get to speak to them. You can't really warn them that you're going to die because it's a flashback. I don't really know what it was, but he then finds out that it's Joe Chill, tracks him down, beats up all of the villains and then might be to blame for his death, I believe. I think it's insinuated that he could have helped, but then didn't. It was like, oh, that's convenient that he died by the roof falling on him. Whoops, guess I didn't see it. Batman's parents die in almost every incarnation. It is intrinsic to the Batman character. His backstory is probably the most famous of all time. It is just an absolute classic piece of writing. And no matter how absurd Batman might guess at times, his parents always have to bring him back. That is the one thing that kind of connects us to him. He might be this beautiful billionaire that's buff and can beat up whoever he wants and has a billion gadgets. But at the end of the day, he is still this 10 year old boy at the opera with his parents. That is what connects him to us, this weak, powerless person. And Batman is who we want to become. We want to be the hero. We want to save the day, get the girl. And every time, they do something with Batman's parents. It's always great to see, as long as they do it well, because that is the ties that bind us. So to come face to face with their murderer is, you know, in real terms, dark as f Would you want to meet a person who murdered your parents? No way. Murder's always messed up, you know, it's always messed up. I think I'm rambling here, so I'm just gonna move on. Despite being usually a very lighthearted and fun show, the episode Nasty Patty goes against the grain and might be the darkest in SpongeBob's run. It's got an absolute black tone to it, and in case you haven't seen it, SpongeBob and Mr. Krabs believe that they have murdered the health inspector. They try to cover up his murder and then get kind of caught by police who just bring them back to the Krusty Krab, and it's like, oh no, we can't bury them there. Oh, how are we gonna get out of this situation? For 15 minutes, they're trying to evade capture on this attempted murder i guess because they thought that the health inspector was a fake and so they kind of poisoned him turns out he wasn't fake and now they have a problem on their hands i mean at the end of the day the episode is literally dedicated to murder and it is so anxiety filled will these characters get caught what will be the consequences of their actions it's a simple plot but again when you contrast it against the light show that is spongebob there is a clear juxtaposition between the episodes and it's just fun to see them take on a more gritty storyline okay content warning from here on out if you are uncomfortable with the topic of suicide please click off this video. It's not for everyone. So I do warn you now that we're going to get into the deepest and darkest areas of the warmest and lightest shows. With that said, Tom and Jerry, Blue Cat Blues. This is the 103rd episode of the series and in six minutes they tell this simple suicide story of Tom and Jerry. Tom is pining after this female cat and long story short, she a gold digger. She belong to the streets. He does absolutely everything he can to win her over, but in the end, it just isn't enough, and she goes off with one of his mates. Tom then literally sits on the train tracks waiting to die. Jerry is narrating the story, and he's like, oh, you know, he's better off in the long run. And then he sees his fiance going off with his mate and joins Tom on the tracks. I understand this was made in like the 1950s, 1940s, but for a show that can be enjoyed by children, a story about these characters waiting for death and wanting to die is boof. They, like they went there they actually went there times have changed and different things are kind of more socially acceptable now this episode for modern audiences is like almost traumatizing the looney tunes episode life with feathers is the first appearance of sylvester the cat but it is a very kind of interesting one to go in on. My oh my, what an introduction. So long story short, there is this bird, I think he's called like a lovebird, and he wants to kill himself because his girlfriend or wife 
is really angry at him. They have broken up, so he just wants to end it all. And to do that, he wants to fly into Sylvester's mouth and just get eaten. The problem is that Sylvester thinks that he's poisoned because why would you just want to die, right? His actions have no logic behind them, according to Sylvester. So Sylvester does not want to eat him. Throughout the episode, the bird ups the ante, trying to kill himself in more creative ways and Sylvester is just having none of it. Every time he flies in, he's like, no, get out. I'm not eating you. End of. Eventually, they flip the script where he finds out that he wants to live, and then Sylvester's like, no, actually, wait, I want to kill you now. And then at the end of the episode, they flip it once more when the bird's girlfriend's like, actually, uh, I'm staying here. Uh, the other bird's like, oh, fucking hell, I might as well just kill myself then. Considering that this episode would be shown to young audiences, the idea of killing yourself over your girlfriend is not really the message that you want to take away. I don't know what the moral was here. But let me say again that this was from the 1950s, so again, maybe some messages might be lost in translation. Some things that they were going for are just lost on modern audiences. SpongeBob One Course Meal. This is the worst of Mr. Krabs, and I actually like Mr. Krabs, but this episode, he is just so unlikable for a character that you're meant to be rooting for. The basics are that Mr. Krabs finds out that Plankton is afraid of whales and he uses this to his advantage, dressing up as his daughter Pearl and traumatizing the guy. Mr. Krabs very rarely goes on the offensive and in this episode he does. He's usually just guarding the formula, but in this one he goes out on the attack and makes Plankton's life a living hell. This doesn't make Mr. Krabs any better than Plankton, so at the end of the episode, you don't really care if Plankton steals the secret formula. The trauma gets so bad that Plankton just wants to lie down in front of a bus and get squashed. He wants to kill himself because he is so petrified that whales are around him that he just wants to die. Eventually, SpongeBob tells him, he's like, you know what, actually, Mr. Krabs is pulling your leg. And then Plankton kind of turns the tables on Mr. Krabs and scares him with mines. As I said, this is just a cruel episode. It's just very mean spirited by Mr. Krabs. And for a show where he is tight, yes, you wouldn't really want him as a boss in real life, but he's enjoyable and sometimes he's a bit of a father figure. In this one, he's just an ass so say what you want. Next up on the agenda, we have mass murder and genocide. I really hope that YouTube doesn't pick out on these words because otherwise I am toast. But up first, we have The Last Airbender, season one, episode three, The Southern Air Temple. I've spoken about The Last Airbender before, but just in case you want a refresher, there are four nations and one of them wants to take over the rest and they will commit genocide to do so. In the third episode of the first season, we see this because there's this guy called the Avatar who can master all four elements and he's He's basically the savior of the world. He is destined to save the world. He was frozen in an iceberg for a hundred years though, and by the time he comes back, he finds that his old friends and mentors are all dead. The reasoning behind this was that they wanted to kill the Avatar, and to do that, you just have to kill all the airbenders because they knew that he was an airbender. So just kill them all, and bada bing, bada boom, he is dead. And yet, it's not until the third episode that we actually see the cruelty and the extent of their genocide. They killed everyone. They killed absolutely everyone. They left no trace behind. And I guess when you get down to it, think of this, right? You are a 12 year old kid. You were frozen in an iceberg for a hundred years. You get out and everyone you knew didn't just die. They were murdered brutally. Your mentors, your friends, your anything. Every single person you knew before is dead. And the world is ending because you stupidly got stuck in an iceberg so you feel a bit of guilt for that too now you have to take down an entire empire just by yourself your two friends your flying bison and whatever the f momo is and for a show that can and should be enjoyed by the whole family genocide is a very dark topic to cover for young audiences because young kids can watch this show but they do bring up the idea that if you were an airbender we are going to go for you just because of who you were born as just because of where you were born just because you were born within this territory we are going to kill you rick and morty rick potion 9 is the sixth episode of the first season of the show and it is perhaps one of the most important because it kind of shows the insignificance of everything in the show the story is that morty wants this girl at school to like him so he goes to his incredible genius granddad who whips him up a love potion long story short there are a few complications and then everyone wants to i guess really be in love with morty morty's granddad rick works out an antidote but this antidote makes matters worse and a further antidote makes things even worse and so everyone's just big blob people now and yeah this is kind of 
correct. <laughs> but this isn't even the kicker, though, because the big thing about the episode is that they have destroyed the world. They have ruined the entire world. There is no way to fix this thing. Everyone is just a big goo person now, and the world is over. Or it would be if Rick couldn't travel between dimensions and he goes to a different dimension and replaces the lives of two deceased Rick and Mortys over there. And the idea that you have to carry a dead corpse of yourself, you see your dead self with a f***ing eye hanging out and you have to bury that messed up. The show does go to dark places, but this is the darkest episode to end the world. And the fact that Rick says we only get three or four of these tops, these worlds to Rick are just futile. You can hop between them and everyone's life is insignificant. The world could end three, four times. It doesn't matter. So in this one episode, we're able to get the ultimate insignificance mixed with world ending actions. We are deep down the iceberg now. And I was told by someone in my Discord that I had to cover this or he would unsubscribe. Again, Discord link in the description. But the dinosaurs, I believe that is the show's name. I think it's dinosaurs. The episode Changing Nature. <laughs> the description for this episode on the iceberg is the dinosaurs await fucking death and yeah they do there were some like bugs that didn't come for springtime and the entire episode is just oh no these big companies are like forcing climate change it was a climate change episode like 30 years ago and for a show that doesn't really seem to be for mature audiences again it does seem to be for kind of like families and stuff the fact that it's about dinosaurs is that we know the ending they're going to go extinct and the episode definitely does kind of poke at that a little bit the message is sometimes a little bit heavy-handed right now my biggest problem is trying to figure out what to do with all this money? <laughs> but at the end of the day, the ending of the episode, nothing gets fixed. It's like, ooh, we're the dinosaurs. What's going to happen to us? Nothing. We've been around for millions of years. <laughs> they say as ice starts to surround the planets. Compared to the start of the episode, by the end, things are much more greener and sicklier. And it kind of goes to places that you're like, wait, they're actually showing this? These characters are going to die. They never resolve anything at all. They kind of just sweep it under the rug. This is going to happen. And, you know, that's how uh, the dinosaurs died out. It was just big business. I believe that the Amazing World of Gumball episode, The Inquisition, is perhaps the show's finale. And for a finale, what better way to end things than the entire world ends? <laughs> of course, there can't be any more episodes. The world is finished. It is a weird fever dream this episode, combining live action with seemingly various forms of animation. But the big thing is that the episode ends with the world f***ing collapsing in on itself. <laughs> the show ends on a cliffhanger and it's a kid's show, but all the characters that you've loved and enjoyed over the past God knows how many seasons are going to die. They're going to fall into this massive void and they are done for. I think the show's can end with protagonists dying, but the fact that they don't show it here is like, oh wow, I think they actually did. Adventure Time, Jake the Human slash Finn the Dog. This is a two-parter and this is like a bad trip, guys. Like, honestly, I don't know who was making this episode. I found this a little bit kind of creepy and I was like, oh, what the fuck's going on here? I think for the most part, this is like an alternate episode of like, what if or something like that. I don't really know. I don't watch Adventure Time too much, but basically Jake is taken into this world and he seals the Ice King's crown and that kind of makes him go mad in the end and then his family like die in a house fire or something and then all these spooky spirits are coming out the sky whilst his dog is just having a chat with this shadow guy things get really dark for a kid show and then the kicker is that the world is then nuked i think jake nukes the world and someone like skeletal remains are like you did this <laughs> just to traumatize this kid obviously the target audience for this show is like younger people i know a few people that do enjoy it they're a bit older but i could definitely imagine some like 10 year olds kind of switching this on seeing the episode and being like nope switching a right off <laughs> the second part of this two-parter is set in like this fallout wasteland and i don't know too much of what's going on because i think the show you would know by now what's going on in the show so it's the first time i don't really understand it too much but all i can say is that the imagery here is kind of messed up and the world gets nuked so <laughs> we only have two more tiers and in this penultimate one we have the heat death of the universe and here we have wallace gets rejected because wendy doesn't like cheese I don't know what to do with this information. I understand that this is about Wallace and Gromit, but this entry does not provide us with which episode this is, so I don't really know what to do with this information. I'm just going to move on to the last one. Finally, you've waited all this time for this. It is the last entry we have. Rick Astley. 
Okay, sure, whatever. That is it from me. Thank you very, very much for watching. And if you enjoyed this, maybe subscribe. Maybe that'd be quite nice. Follow me on my social media too. I've got an Instagram. I've got a Twitter. I've got a Patreon, which would be very nice. I've got an email. So if you've got like iceberg charts and stuff, you can send them there. I might be able to look at them. I have a Discord, which you should join because it's like really chill. And I think that's it. So my patrons, shout out to them. I have Cage101101. I've got Chris M. And I have Brandon. We have a very new patron. So shout out Brandon. Thank you very, very much for your support. Speaking of shout outs, I just need to say a massive thank you to Walrus, Walrus 64, FTZ, PLTC. Thank you guys. I always cover your icebergs. They are the best. Thank you so much for the content. Also, Pen and Hex Studios, Invisible Elliot, and The Making Gamer Kid 74, U5. Massive shout out. Thank you so, so much for your work. I only scratched the surface in this video, so if it does well, I will come back and finish the iceberg because I probably only did about like half, maybe a third. There are just so many entries here. So if this does well, we will go back and we will look at some more dark episodes. Apart from that, let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next because I'm only 71 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.